Acts chapter 20, verses uh, 28, verses 31. I remember preaching on that when I was in the book of Acts. Keep watch over yourselves, number one, and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which you bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. The role of the pastor teacher, the primary role of the pastor teacher, is... There are five essential there is there are five roles of a pastor in scripture. Number one is feeding. Next one is guarding to guard, guarding. The next one is discerning, discerning. Number th four is equipping. And the next one is embodying, E-M-B-O-D-Y-I-N-G, enabling people to do the work of the ministry. I think sometimes we misunderstand the role of the pastor in the church. He has a role just like every individual in the church has a role. His role, his one role, and then everyone else has a specific role in the ministry. And I think sometimes that... Uh, let me give you... 11 words real quickly. You don't have to write these down, but let me, because you might hold me to it. Paul practiced what he preached about how to guard the church. One of my jobs is to guard the church against false doctrine and to guard the church against wolves that would come in and destroy you. You do realize that Satan's job is to get you off track, mm -hmm. to misdirect you. Number one is affirming. Quick to identify evidence of God's work in persons and people. My job is to affirm in you, if God is working in your life, I should be able to see it. And I need to affirm that. Number two is thankful. Ready to express gratitude for any act of generosity. A pastor's job is, to, you know, and one thing is to be thankful for what you do. Number three is corrective. And I think here's where probably I have not done a good job. I do try, so when I, you know, when I'm correcting Carlos, it's my job. Uh, corrective, in other words, never re he's never reluctant to identify sin and rebuke it. Never reluctant to identify sin and rebuke it. If I'm going to guard you against doctrine and guard against you, is is that I I I need to have the attitude of being corrective. If a sheep, a shepherd sees a sheep straying away, he's not going to say, "Well, go ahead." Find your own way. It, a pastor should be corrected. Number four is prophetic. Warning of consequences if people were bent on making bad decisions. If you are if you're in my flock, I have a responsibility, according to the Apostle Paul, to warn you of the consequences of people who are bent on making bad decisions. So, on occasion I will say, I really feel biblically that you're making a wrong decision. I need to make that as a pastor shepherd. Right. 
I mean, that's my job as a pastor, spiritual number a number you five. Spell that last what? You spell that last Prophetic. P R O P H E T I C. Prophetic. Oh, okay. I mean, I, it's obviously that I should be able to spiritually be discerning enough to know if you are taking into your home uh, <coughs> Mormons to hold Bible study. I should be able to be discerning enough to say you don't need to do that. I mean, that is, that's, that's why God gave you me to be your overseer spiritually. I'm always like that. Number seven is transparent. No, number six is protective. Number five. No, number five is instructive. Thank you. Instructive. Engaging the theological basis of people's faith. Enlarging, excuse me. I don't have any trouble doing that. Enlarging your theological basis of people's faith. That's why I've been teaching on the attributes of God. That's why I've been teaching on how to use the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm preaching on tonight. I need to enlarge your faith in Christ. Number six is protective. Quick to defend those who are vulnerable. Protect. And I do try to protect people. Number seven is transparent. Transparent. I am... I, I am in other words, this means that I'm unashamed to speak of my own weaknesses and sin. Mm -hmm. Number eight is affectionate. I got to where I hugged a little bit later, but affection is anxious for people to know how much I love them. And occasionally I can say I love you. I, sometimes I do that. You know, in other words, I have to say some affection occasionally. I mean, if you got a pastor that just flat out don't like you, you know, that's kind of hard to show up on Sunday morning knowing he don't like you. And number nine, prayerfully, frequently praying aloud in his... Paul frequently prayed aloud for his people. And, and if you go back and read his epistles, what did he pray for? Paul's prayer for his people was not... I don't know, I can't find any place in the Bible that Paul ever prayed for someone's sickness. He, I'm sure he did. But basically he prayed that you may grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you may grow in your love. And number ten is development. Development. This is what I enjoy, have done the most over my years of ministry. The one that I love the most is identifying and raising up those who might become leaders and that's I love doing that the most I've done that as a youth director finding someone who I could take in and disciple and train to be to be a leader in the church and that is so essential and then number 11 observable observable presenting a model of Christ, Christ following life that others could copy I mean, I do try to present personally a Christ-like life that I'm not embarrassed for you to follow. And that's, that's part of the pastor's job. That's what the shepherd does with the sheep. So I think that is important to do that. And, and interesting. Um... I think it is, I read this week in, in a leadership journal, one of the areas that pastors make a mistake at, one of the biggest mistakes pastors make in leaders in the church is they try to grow a church without leaders. They try to grow a church without leaders. Would I like to see two, three hundred people in this church? Most definitely I would, but I'd like to see five or six uh, leaders in the church that could handle that, that we could handle that many people. I would like to see, I would like to grow leaders that, that could present themselves as people that are discipling the ones that we have here. Uh, I, I, you, 
there's no, I, when I went to Altoona, uh, I said the first thing we need to do is get the building looking nice. Number two is we need to have people in the church who are leaders before we draw, bring in a whole bunch of people that don't, we, don't, we don't know what to do with them until after we get them. After we get them. And so we need, you need to develop leaders, grow leaders, and then people, then you can grow. Grow leaders and you can grow. And so I think that's one of the things. And secondly, I heard this week, and I'll close with this. You think it's good to be having a big, huge church. I don't understand. This week, I read the paper, as a matter of fact, yesterday. A huge mega church in uh, Palm Beach, Florida, the Summit Church of Orlando, excuse me, the pastor of the church, the founder of the popular Summit Church in Orlando, resigned this week amidst adultery scandal. His dad was a, his dad is a great preacher, great evangelist, and has a big church. And in 2002. The son decided to build and get his own church. And he started out with 25. And by 2000 and 2012, he's in five locations and an estimate of 5,000 worshipers. He has over 5,000 people following him in five locations. He's 35 years old and he had, his wife had an injunction because of violence, drug abuse, and guns and drugs was found in his house. And so he had to resign. And I, I don't understand I don't understand how a person can take a church, a group of people <coughs> And in a matter of five or six years, you grow to 5,000 people. People, you know, talk about growing. And yet he was, he was, he's probably not even a Christian. But he had the ability of giftedness and the ability of communication and leaders that followed him. And yet he himself did not present himself as godly. It happens all the time. So I, I, I think it, it hurts the cause of Christ. Uh, it hurts people that blatantly, blatantly and follow men, and yet he has three kids, 11, 9, and 5, and it happens all the time. And so I think it's essential that we don't, you know, I, I want to grow, but I want to grow Christians. Right. Yes. Identifying and raising up those who might become leaders. I mean, we need Sunday school teachers. We need soul winners. We need youth leaders. We need people who can teach the Word of God. We need people that can do the spiritual aspect of the church and a church can't grow unless you don't have them. Every church I ever went to, the church grew. That's why they called me there. Then it grew, then they fired me. Yeah, figure that out. That's so stupid. My mother told me, Charles, if you go over to the church this was when I was 19 years old. She said, Charles, I can tell you that if you go to the church and your class starts growing, the preacher will fire you. He'll have you, he'll have you painting his houses. Now, my mom told me that, and I was stupid enough to say, Oh, Mom, you don't know anything about preachers. Yeah, I was only married to one 22 years. And uh, it was the... It was an experience that I was, I ended up painting houses. Preachers are so dumb. And the more you look stupid, the better they like you. Preachers like dumb, preach, most preachers like associates who are dummies. And never say anything. I've never been that kind of person.
like me or kick me out of it. Neither do I. And, uh, so, anyway, teaching and training. And it's it's not it, it's more than just it's just you know it's, it's 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 God has a ministry for all of us. All of you here have a ministry, and Bob went over that. It's still on the bulletin board back there. All of you have a ministry in this church. We're ministering together. I have my ministry, and you have yours. But I don't have your ministry. I can't do what you do, and I shouldn't try to do what you do. Preachers try to do what you should be doing. And that's not good. It's the reason I don't sing. I'll leave that up to the rest of you to sing. Okay? Alright. Any questions on that? Do you have any comments on that? Does that sound reasonable? Jimmy, do you have any thought on that? Uh, I'm just thinking that every, everyone that's in here right now as I know, the ones I know are uh, servants or vessels of God. 